Hello, and welcome to this episode of the AWS podcast series, Innovation Ambassadors. I'm Sarah Armstrong, your host and head of Innovation and Transformation Programs at AWS. Along with my co-hosts from around the world, we'll act as your ambassadors to some of the most interesting prototyping and innovation engagements with our AWS customers. We provide you with a roadmap to innovation and cloud technology solutions. We're so glad you joined us on this journey. In this episode, we're taking a closer look at the journey of Instructure, an education technology company that's on a simple yet powerful mission to amplify the power of teaching and inspire everyone to learn together. Hear about their collaborative effort with the AWS prototyping team and their cloud architecture that harnesses the power of generative AI and serverless technologies to simplify instructional content generation for educators and students around the world. I'm excited to welcome from Instructure, Zach Pendleton, Chief Architect. Zach, thanks so much for joining us. Thanks so much for having me, Sarah. I'm excited to be here. And joining us from AWS Prototyping, we have Katie Standish, Senior Program Manager from our Worldwide Specialist team. Katie, great to catch up with you. Hi, Sarah. Thanks for having me. And also from AWS, we have Gianluca Bertelli, Senior Machine Learning Prototyping Engineer. Hey, Gianluca, how are you? Hi, Sarah. Thanks for inviting me. Great. Well... Zach, can you share a little bit about Instructure for our international listeners? Certainly. Instructure is a teaching and learning company dedicated to elevating student success and amplifying the power of teaching around the world. And we do that with a number of our products, things like the Canvas Learning Management System or the Mastery Connect assessment tool. And we believe that when we extend the reach and impact of education, everybody can learn better together. Fantastic. And tell me a little bit about what your team specifically does. As part of my work as chief architect, I work with our advanced development team. And so this is a small group of technologists that are tasked with researching cutting edge technology and understanding how we could apply that to solve the pressing problems in education today and in the future. So how did you come uh, to work with Katie and John Luca and the team? Like most research organizations, Uh, I imagine we've been really concerned with generative AI in the last six months to a year and have been doing a lot of work in understanding how we could use these tools to improve teacher workflows and uh, to unlock new methods of learning for students. One of the challenges we have with these models in education is that we work with a lot of very sensitive data and it's really important that we keep student data safe, that we protect uh, educator content. And so our our customers have told us over and over again that while they see a lot of potential in these products like we do, they want to make sure that they get the same data privacy and security guarantees that they get from us today. So when we approached Amazon to talk about how we could leverage these tools, one uh, idea that we came up with together was maybe hosting some of these large language models in our cloud so that we could expose these new exciting tools to our customers without putting any of their information in the hands of another third party. Katie, take us a little bit through the process of how we worked with Zach and the team to build out Prototype. So when we met with Zach and his team, we really wanted to work backwards from their end users to solve some of the challenges that they have around common tasks that teachers and educators do on a daily basis. So the idea was to automate some of those tasks using generative AI and allow those teachers to take the time that they've saved and then go reinvest that time working directly with their students. In working backwards from teachers and educators, we identified three common use cases that every teacher is doing on a day-to-day basis that were really great chances to optimize their time. So those three use cases were around generating course content. So the first is around creating um, lesson content that students would then interact with on a teacher's Canvas site. Once students have interacted with that content, once they've learned or read through the content that the teachers created, we want them to then interact with the content. So we want to ensure that they're engaging with their peers, that they're understanding the content and participating in discussions. 
The second tool that we developed was to generate discussion questions that teachers could then post to their online discussion forum. And then finally, when we think about an educator and the workflow that they go through, we really want to make sure that our students are grasping the content that we've taught, that they are proficient in the standards that we're assessing them on. And so to do that, we need to have a really um, robust bank of assessment questions, whether those are formative assessment questions or summative assessment questions. We want to make sure that teachers have uh, lots of multiple choice questions that they can choose from. And so we created a tool that will generate assessment questions with feedback on a specific lesson topic of the teacher's choosing. So Zach, those three key user stories that you focused in on were something that you'd heard already from your customer base, is that right, of this is where they spend a lot of their time? That's right. So uh, educators spend a lot of time and thought in designing course content like this. And frequently, uh, especially in the case of something like quiz questions, it's the type of work that we call high cognitive load, low satisfaction. They're things that take a lot of uh, thought and energy from instructors, but they're not the things that get instructors excited about being teachers. Uh, and so we want wherever we can to accelerate those workflows so that instructors spend less mental energy doing those tasks and have more time and effort to apply in the classroom and directly with students. Uh, and another really nice benefit of that is that in the case of formative assessment, like Katie mentioned, if we can speed up those workflows and simplify them, it means that instructors can take advantage of those best practices more often. So students have a better experience and more opportunities to reinforce their learning than they would have if teachers had to do all of this manually. And teachers can create some differentiation for students to enrich their learning. That's right. It, it helps the, the instructor take their knowledge and then package that in lots of different formats for students at different grade levels or uh, abilities. Fantastic. So when we talk about how we went from these ideas to actually building something that we could use, maybe you can tell us, Zach, a little bit about the learning management system and the standards that you use with Canvas. We want to make sure when we're building out a feature like this, especially with a, a tool that may be unfamiliar to educators, that we wrap it in workflows that they know and understand so that they have a little more control over that process. And so in education, we're really fortunate to have lots of open standards and interoperability tools. And in this case, there's one in particular called LTI that allowed us to build this new tool with generative AI to layer it directly into the existing workflows that educators know about. So that while the underlying technology may be new and interesting, uh, the user experience is what they're already comfortable with. John Luca, take us through that new technology, how did you approach bringing in some of these Gen AI tools uh, into the system? So we started selecting the LLM model to use, and we chose to go with the Flan T5 in its large version because uh, it's the model that uh, fits perfectly with our use cases. We created a serverless architecture around this model, uh, an architecture where we have a lambda as a single entry point that is responsible to hide all the complexity to call the model. And in this lambda, we have a single interface for the caller, for uh, Flux teams in this case. And the lambda is also responsible to do some prompt engineering and fine-tune the parameters for the calls to uh, this large language model. The larger language model, the Flan T5, as I said, is uh, from SageMaker Jumpstart. That means it can be easily deployed to any AWS account. In this case, we deployed the model in a SageMaker endpoint that allows us to eventually scale uh, in case the, the volume of the calls increase, suddenly increase. So, Zach, that scalability really important for your user base, is that right? That's right. Because we've got millions and millions of teachers and students across the world, uh, we want to make sure that this can reach all of them because the future of education isn't really exciting if it isn't equitably distributed. Talk to us a little bit about how the teams work together. I understand you have an uh, engineering team, Zach, that was working together with John Luca and the engineering team on the AWS side. Is that right? That's correct. Our advanced development team works in research sprints that last about six weeks long. And 
it's a pretty agile uh, team. And so we were really excited when the Amazon team was able to come in and adapt really quickly to those workflows and, uh, and work right in parallel with our team. So, uh, you know, we were able to quickly identify where the seams in the solution were and to divide up that work so that the teams could work side by side and then connect, uh, you know, once or twice a week and share learnings and updates. And, uh, and we were able to make a lot of progress really quickly. So, you know, we often talk in this podcast about innovation and experimentation, not really being an experiment if you know how it's going <laughs> to, everything that you're going to do, uh, or you know the exact path you're going to take. And so we often run into obstacles and challenges along the way. John Luke, can you talk a little bit about how we overcame some of those challenges? Certainly, we, we had some challenges during this prototype. Uh, first of all, we started trying to uh, find the best prompts to use. We started from the zero prompts and we end up with a few shots prompts, but the majority of the time has been spent trying to reduce the hallucination. The large language model sometimes hallucinates, so the response that it gives to you is not properly correct. So we, we try to minimize these occurrences and we, we create a complex logic in our Python code that is within the, the Lambda that wraps all together. Uh, in this Lambda, we uh, actually do multiple calls to the model uh, in order to not only have the, the correct transfer, but also to have the reasoning part. So uh, in order to have uh, the large language model to explain why a particular option is correct or is not correct. And this was the, the major challenge that we, we have seen so far. Hmm. And Zach, in addition to that technical approach that we can take to reducing hallucinations and ensuring that we're getting really good fidelity out of the model, you also added the human in the loop. Is that right? Well, that was an important consideration for you, wasn't it? Absolutely. So we talked at the beginning about how our users were really concerned about the security and safety of using these types of models. And while we can make sure that uh, we're being responsible stewards with the data transfer, we also need to make sure that we're thinking about these things in a way that keeps humans at the forefront, and especially in education, where we don't want to add a third voice to the classroom. And we don't want these tools to become a robot tutor in the sky so much as we want to take that teacher's voice and that teacher's content and extend and amplify that in powerful ways to reach students when the educator can't be in the classroom. You mentioned that you do these sprints in six weeks, but in this particular case, you had a hard stop, didn't you? A hard deadline that you were working towards. That's right. So at the end of this six-week sprint, we had our international user conference in StructureCon, and we were hoping to be able to demonstrate the work that we were doing with the Amazon team to our, our customers. So that included administrators and educators who were coming from all around the globe to learn a little bit more about the future of education and about some of our research. And you didn't know when you started working at AWS, maybe, that Katie was also a former educator and principal. So this is near and dear to your heart, wasn't it, Katie? You had the opportunity to go to this conference. Yeah, I I uh, was really privileged. I had the opportunity to go to InstructureCon and present these tools that we developed with Instructure um, and AWS to educators. Um, and it was so exciting to see other educators um, coming in and just being really wowed um, and delighted by what our teams put together. Um, so we were in the educational moments of the future room, which was Instructure's uh, Think Big ideas about what the future of education can be like um, when we're harnessing the powers of new technology. And the first stop in that room was the content creation booth, where we showcased these three tools that we developed. I put on my former educator hat and we talked through a specific teacher user story around eighth grade science and generating content on photosynthesis. Over 600 educators came through the room, and the number one question that we got from educators as we concluded our presentation was, when will this be available in my Canvas account, and how can I sign up to participate in beta testing? So teachers were really excited about the opportunity to use generative AI and these tools, in particular in a familiar way 
through the site that they already know and trust with Instructure and Canvas. Zach, that's pretty gratifying to have been in this very high-velocity engagement and then to have that kind of success from your end users, yeah? Absolutely. It was uh, really, really exciting, you know, to go from uh, the idea that we thought was pretty compelling and, and then to see educators respond in that way. So where are we now, Zach? What's next on the journey for Instructure and these tools? Yeah, so we, we certainly want to uh, take advantage of all of that excitement and, and deliver something to that broader customer base that we've got so that everybody can start using these tools and, and learn from them. And so our advanced development team right now is working on rolling these features out into a small beta so that we can continue to collect some user feedback and uh, scale these so that hopefully next year we'll, we'll see them in the product where all of our users are able to access these and take advantage of this new technology. That's so exciting, Zach. I was wondering if maybe you could each reflect on the experience and share with our listeners what your, your key takeaways were. John Luke, I'll start with you. Yes, so it has been a very great experience for me. Uh, this was my first prototype in the generative AI space. My main takeaway is about hallucination. Uh, I think it's so easy to start with large language model, but at the same time, it's very difficult to deal with this hallucination. And this is uh, actually an area where we need to continue to focus on. It's a great opportunity for everybody uh, of us. Great. Thanks, Gianluca. Katie, how about you? I think uh, my key takeaway from this is just the idea of a one-team approach um, and how successful we can be when we are collaborating and co-developing AWS and a customer. So we had really a seamless workflow with the Instructure team, and they just had such outstanding engineers who contributed to the success of this project. And it was really gratifying to see that work then showcased for educators and the excitement that those teachers and university professors and other administrators had for the work that we had done and how that will, you know, resonate and positively impact millions of students worldwide was really exciting. Fantastic. And Zach, I'll leave the final words for you. When we started this project, there was some concern that with such a tight timeline, trying to grow the team and extend it with this team from Amazon was actually going to slow us down or make it harder to get progress made. And uh, we were really, really pleasantly surprised and, and delighted to find that uh, the Amazon team just met us exactly where we were at. Everybody was so responsive and helpful and uh, it just slipped right into our workflow. So that, to Katie's point, it really felt like we were one team uh, working together and we were able to get so much done and really appreciated their, their expertise and how excited that they were too with our mission at, at improving teacher uh, experience and, and the quality of education for students. Fantastic. Thank you, Zach, Katie, John Luca, for being with us here today. Thanks, Sarah. Thanks so much for having us. Thank you, Sarah. I'd like to thank our listeners for coming on today's journey with us. Look for future episodes of our podcast on your favorite podcast platform. Share your ideas for future episodes or comments on this one via the email in the description. Thank you. Thank you.